Hey everybody, and welcome to um, the Governor's Councilor, Governor's Council meeting today, hearing, and I will read the letter of nomination. Um, my name is, I. before that I'll introduce, my name is Eileen Duff, I am the counsel for the district, so I will chair the hearing. And um, I will introduce, actually I'll take the moment now to introduce the our other counselors are with us online. We have, uh, Joining us, Councillor Robert Jubinville, Councillor Christopher Ionella, Councillor Joseph Fiera, and Councillor Mary Hurley. Good morning. Uh, in the State House, we have Councillor Paul DePaolo, Councillor Terrence Kennedy, Councillor Mar Marilyn Petito Devaney. And I think I got all eight of us. So, as well as our, our nominee today. So, we'll start out with the letter. Um, from the governor, dear counselors, I'm pleased to nominate Kristen Buxton to the position of Associate Justice of the Superior Court. I submit this nomination for the advice and consent of the Executive Council pursuant to Part 2, Chapter 2 of the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I am enclosing the nominee's resume for your convenience. Sincerely, Charles D. Baker. Um, so at this time, we will ask for um, witnesses who are here to testify on behalf of the nominee. And whoever would like, whoever's scheduled to go first, I don't have a list. Attorney Kevin Mitchell. Attorney Kevin Mitchell, terrific. Um, Councillor Duff, the, the witnesses are Judge Jeff Kopp, Attorney Kevin. I can't hear. And Linda Brodett. Yeah. Can you hear me? I, I, I got you, Marilyn. We just introduced them. I couldn't I, hear the, the nominee, Eileen. The, that's because the nominee hasn't spoken yet. Oh, that was, uh, yeah. that was Marilyn. Sorry. That was Marilyn. Um, I think there's a little bit of confusion. Let's go with... Um, because we're on Zoom. Actually, I see Judge Carp is on Zoom. Um, Judge Carp, why don't I have you go first since you're joining us remotely? Marilyn, I'm chairing the hearing. Thank you for respecting that. Go ahead, Judge Carp. Thank you. Um, can you folks hear me? Yes, yes we can. We can. So. Okay. Uh, good morning, Lieutenant uh, Governor. Good morning, Lieutenant Governor Polito and counselors. Uh, I am honored and humbled to be given the opportunity to speak this morning because I cannot think of a better candidate uh, than Kristen Buxton to join me as a colleague on the Superior Court bench. I've known Kristen for about 11 years, uh, during which she was the lead prosecutor on, on a number of first degree murder cases I defended in Essex County. And we became friendly because among other reasons, uh, we, have a, we have sons that are about the same age. And I got to know her as a wonderfully dedicated mom to her son. Kristen is an exceptionally talented, hardworking trial attorney. During my 24 years as an attorney, I tried more than 100 cases all over the Commonwealth as a prosecutor, as a criminal defense attorney, and in civil cases. And I can honestly say that Kristen is in the top three of adversaries against whom I ever tried a case. And I know this to be true because about 10 years ago this very month, we began uh, a six week long difficult um, strike that we, we spent six long difficult weeks together uh, trying a first degree murder case in front of Judge David Lowy. And during that trial, I was blown away uh, by the level of Kristen's preparation, her ability to deftly handle numerous challenging circumstances that came up in that trial, and how much that our 16 jurors connected with her and trusted her. But much more importantly than Kristen's tremendous legal skills is her terrifically, um, is the fact that Kristen is a terrifically empathetic, thoughtful, humble and forthright human being. And I know her to be an extremely selfless co-worker to whom other assistant DAs gravitate and emulate. But still even more importantly, 
Kristen passes my personal litmus test for being an exceptional candidate to become a judge. That is, I am confident she will not change when she puts on that black robe and that Kristen will remain the compassionate, considerate, unpretentious and straightforward person I know her to be. Um, thank you again for allowing me uh, the opportunity to tell you why I strongly believe, strongly believe, without any equivocation, that Kristen will be a outstanding member of the Superior Court bench uh, if you confirm her. Uh, and I thank you, counselors, for your time and your dedication to the important role you play in our democracy. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Madam Chair. Kennedy? Yes, Council Kennedy, please. Judge, uh, just a comment on something you said. Are you suggesting some judge change because they get the robe on? I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, from, yes, I'm speaking from Attorney Mitchell's reaction. He, he's never heard of, any of that either. Not only am I suggesting it, I'm saying it. Unfortunately, uh, this is what I look. Well, let me say, clarify. This is uh, what I learned as a member of the bar. I have not found that to be the case as a member of ju the judiciary, especially if my chief justice is listening. That was a very political <laughs> answer, Judge. Very political answer. Well said, <laughs> sir. Well said. Any other counselors' questions for Judge Carp? Yes, I'm recognizing you, Marilyn. Oh, thank you. Um, nice seeing you again, Judge. N uh, nice seeing you, Counselor Devaney. Uh, no, I just wanted to follow up on my colleague. Unfortunately, a robe does change people when they get in the bench because we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know how that change will come. But having said that, I, uh, you know her well. You've seen her in court. Um, I, I love what you said about the nominee. Can you give me one attribute that you can think of uh, that um, she brings to the court that is most prominent? Empathy. Excellent. I mean, it, it, frankly, there's there's a number of attributes, but, it, but if I had to pick one, I'd pick empathy. Now, don't get me wrong. She, um, uh, Krista Buxton is no shrinking violet. Uh, she is a formidable opponent, but um, she is empathetic. Well, you know, I, I've said it, and uh, probably people are getting sick of me saying it, but I look for empathy and compassion, and I won't vote for anyone who doesn't have those qualities. So I'm really pleased that, that you chose empathy. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Councilor Devaney. Anybody else? Judge Karp, great to see you again. Uh, you. Keep up the good work and keep your, your family and the, keep the court safe for us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilor Duff. And if you don't mind, I'm going to just quietly attend. That, that's why I thought you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that's why we called you first. And apologies to, to uh, Mr. Mitchell, who was ready to testify. I, I yanked it from you in a second. But um, uh, Mr. Mitchell, if we would love to hear you now. Thank you, sir. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, I am obviously going to echo what Judge Karp said, but because I'm still a trial lawyer, it will probably take me a lot longer to say it. <laughs> uh, I would like to say good morning to all of you members of the Governor's Council. My name is Kevin Mitchell, and I am an attorney with the law office now in Dedham, Massachusetts. And I thank you for this opportunity to support Judge Baker's wise decision to put before you Kristen Buxton's nomination as an Associate Justice of the Superior Court. I have had the opportunity on a number of occasions to appear before you on behalf of other, I think, well-qualified individuals. And in the course of that, uh, I have clearly seen how serious and careful you are in your deliberations. And I am confident that if you approve Kristen Buxton for the Superior Court, this will just be another example of this body's continued excellence in the performance of your duties. Uh, in what actually feels like another life, in the past, I was an assistant district attorney, briefly in Middlesex County so long ago that it was under John Droney, 
for the past almost 30 years in Essex County, both under Kevin Burke and Jonathan Blodgett. And it was in that capacity as an assistant DA, having had some meaningless title of supervisor, that I sort of self-described as shepherd to a herd of cats in the Superior Court. Uh, I first met Kristen and began what is now really a 25-year relationship with her. Not just a professional relationship, but for me, more meaningfully, a personal deep friendship. And it is over that period of time that I've been able to watch her grow both as an attorney, but also mature in her life experiences. A maturity that I think is always critical for any person, judge of district, superior, or any level. Uh, I know you have reviewed her applications, letters of reference, and whatever material may have been sent. You have had the opportunity to listen to Judge Carp, and they can clearly speak to her intellect, her scholarship, her vast trial experience. But 25 years of knowing Kristen Buxton, and if you will allow me to call her Kristen, because that's how I think of her, I think I can speak more to her personal side, mm -hmm. her human qualities. I am absolutely confident in telling you that I believe she possesses what, in my opinion, is a critical quality of a judge. You may not agree, but I believe it is, and that is that she's basically a humble person. By that, I mean she is not haughty, she is not arrogant, she's not filled with her own sense of self-importance, she will listen to the points that others make. She's not afraid to state when she can be wrong. She is, in fact, if you will, educable. To sort of pick up on a comment made earlier, there is no doubt in my mind that Kristen Buxton will never accuse her appointment with an anointment. She is, in fact, one of the most decent human beings that I know. Kristen started in the district court. You have her experience. We use sometimes selfishly the district court as our training ground for superior court because the district court is unique in that it has so many cases. It is so close to the concerns of the community that if an individual prosecutor or defense attorney has to learn quickly how to interact with people on the other side, colleagues, court staff, and also with the community. They have to develop a, skin, a skill set to make judgments, a critical importance for a judge, to make judgments and to evaluate changing situations. And also, Counselor Devaney, they have to learn how to empathize, not just with victims, though that may be their job, but also to empathize with defendants. I am now in the defense side. I must tell you, I have learned things on this side I wish I had had the maturity to know when I was a prosecutor. When you select, when you represent a young man who finds himself in the most critical of crimes and you get to see all that is in his background and the circumstances. Kristen shined in the district court, she will shine on the bench. When she came to Superior Court, because I was her supervisor, I work with her on a daily basis. I could see the level of preparation that Judge Karp discusses. We talked about cases. We talked about dispositions. She clearly represented the Commonwealth's interest. She was zealous in her concerns for the victim, but she always understood that there was a defendant. Her concerns then was because of her job as a prosecutor, and it was correct. Her concerns as a judge, I know, because I know her personality, I know her heart. She will recognize that she must address both sides, because both sides need that court to be one of fairness. Lastly, let me just say one of the good things about being on the defense side <clears throat> is that I now have the golden ticket that allows me to sit on the other side of a courtroom. And as we all know, defense attorneys are a chatty group. And I can tell you that over these 15 years, I have heard people speak of her reputation. I have had the opportunity to actually have a trial, not a trial, but a case with her, a serious sexual 
assault while she was prosecuting in Superior Court. Yes, she was zealous in her defense, but she was fear at all times. Her reputation amongst the defense bar is stellar. She is fair, she is prepared. I have, by virtue of my age, many friends far more successful in their legal careers than I who have became judges. I can tell you they gossip too. Her reputation amongst the judges is the same. Members of the jury, I must be honest with you, and that is simply this. I do have one hesitation. And that hesitation is simply that if you appoint her to the bench, I am going to miss dearly those opportunities to meet with her in a corridor, fly her with the Starbucks only coffee, and listen <laughs> to her tell wonderful stories and swell with pride about her son, Ryder, who is at St. John's Prep. However, she will probably not miss having to say my grandchildren are cute when I show her all the children. <laughs> Members of the uh, Governor's <coughs> Council, I ask you please allow this nomination to go through. It is a decision of which you will always be proud. Thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney Mitchell. That was very passionate and heartfelt. Um, and do any of the councils have questions for the attorney? Councilor Devaney. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming. I, I, I'm glad you're in person. I like to look in your eyes. Um, I have to tell you, I've been here a long time, 21 years, and I have seen witnesses who, when I've asked them, you know, how do you know the nominee? Maybe one time that they had a case opposing attorneys in court. And, and what your testimony is what I want to hear. You not only know her 25 years as an attorney, but you know her as a person. And that means an awful lot to me. Um, and I have to say that, um, you know, when you talk about her qualifications and you talk about the people that you know became judges and you're not, don't think that you're not more qualified than they are because some of them come through and they're not. Okay, I haven't said that. I never now, have. <laughs> unfortunately. Um, okay, now you talked about a case. Now, can you... Um, reference a case that stands out in your mind that you were so impressed with the nominee? Well, <clears throat> as her supervisor, <clears throat> excuse me, as her supervisor, there were just so many cases and they come at you. I guess I can only simply talk about my own personal experience. My case involved an individual, and I don't want to go into the details, but I assure you, very few people would find him um, an acceptable human being in his behaviors and lifestyle. It was hard for me, having come from a prosecutor's background, to now advocate as effectively as I could for an individual. What I was amazed at by Kristen was that that never was an issue uh, when I talked to her, at what the accusations were, she looked at, as she should, the evidence she had to establish it. She looked at his background, looked at the victims. And in this case, as often happens, the victim themselves had issues to bring forward. And when it was over, she handled it in an incredibly fair way. Never allowed any personal feeling she may have about my client's behaviors to interfere with doing a fair job. And that's really the best I can say. You know, murder cases after a while in this business become another murder case. But that was my dealings with her in private conversation. Well, your testimony means a lot to me. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Do any of the other counselors have questions for Attorney Mitchell? Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Hearing none. Thank you, Attorney. That was really terrific. You, you brought a lot of uh, value to us this morning, so I appreciate it. Um, our next witness is probably, in some of our opinions, the most important one, no pressure. Uh, it is Linda Brodett. Is Miss Brodett there? 
Yes, she is. Terrific. It's a long walk. <laughs> I'm just uh, six days post surgery hardware removal, so a little ginger in my you foot. Take your mask off. Well, thank you for um for taking the time to be with us. Can you tell us who you are and your relationship to the nominee, please? I'd be happy to. Thank you for having me here today. My name is Linda Brodette. And I have actually had uh, the great honor and privilege speaking to you about Kristen. I've been um, Kristen's legal assistant going on 17 years now with the Essex District Attorney's Office. And the qualities that I most uh, attribute with Kristen, but not limited to, um, that Kristen is fair and kind, patient, knowledgeable, articulate, very approachable, truly one of the most approachable individuals I've had the absolute pleasure of interacting with. Kristen is um, extremely well respected within our office. Uh, if anyone has even the slightest concerns, not even related to work, they know they have a friend and a confidant in Kristen. Um, She's just one of a kind. I can't speak more highly of that. Um, Kristen's demeanor is always cool and calm under the pressures of a very heavy workload. And even though her workload is very heavy, she always finds the time to help guide the less seasoned attorneys um, that are just new into our office. She is fair and impartial. She's quick to offer sound advice with a delivery that's unmatched by her peers. But more importantly, and the best part about Kristen, which I'm so, so honored to speak to you about, is that Kristen is a proud and dedicated mother of a teenaged son. Kristen makes sure that she's there for Ryder at all his school and sporting events. She's a carpool mom who has the absolute best disposition. She genuinely enjoys every minute she gets to spend with her child. And it's very clear to anyone that parenting is truly her greatest joy. For all that Kristen does in her professional and personal life, it's also worth noting that Kristen is a very civic-minded individual. Kristen gives back to her hometown of Ipswich. She has volunteered on many committees, one of which helped to build a park. In the, she helped spearhead a um, fundraising um, organization that helped build the new park for both young and old for them to enjoy for decades to come. I could go on for hours. I really don't even need this piece of paper. Kristen is truly one of the greatest, greatest people I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. She is, I'm going to miss her so much. I have 17 years I've worked. She was my first assignment coming from the private sector into um, state, you know, working for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I hit the ground running with her. The connection was just so instantaneous because that is her personality. Warm, kind, loving, truthful, sincere. If you have a week, I could just keep talking. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I like your humor. <laughs> um, thank you. Have you concluded? I want to make sure. Oh, yeah, I'll keep talking. You don't want that. To <laughs> yeah, that's all right. No, thank you so much. Um, you know, I said you were the most important witness today. No disrespect for the judge or the attorney, but you're somebody who's worked with her in the trenches day by day, minute by minute. And you probably have such a great sense of, of um, who she really truly is in a way that uh, isn't always seen. And so we appreciate you sharing with us um, what you know and and your thoughts are are, are very um, very well respected and, and appreciated here. Do any of the counselors have questions? I do. Of course, Marilyn. Thank you for coming. 
Thank you for coming. Um, you are, you know, I, I love to hear from attorneys, judges, but someone that works day to day, 17 years, um, you know the person she is personally, and um, you know her ups and downs. And I, you know, so hearing from you, I have to say, I don't think there's many people would say about their boss that that was the greatest person that they knew. I yeah. think that's that's amazing. And, um, you know, 17 years, uh, you really get to know a person. Um, and, and you've seen her under stress and you've seen her when she's, you know, overworked and everything in, in, in you. Um, what would you say about that when she is put under stress? Probably, I mean, she's had horrendous cases. You know, child abuse, murders, uh, rapes. I, I can't even imagine, you know, um, hearing those cases, you know? Kristen under pressure is no different than Kristen not under pressure. She is so even keeled. I, I can anticipate her need before she would even ask it. But Kristen is just so even keeled you just she's un, unwaverable well that's wonderful um thank you for coming uh it, you know the personal test testimony to me it really gets to my heart because you have come here um wanting to speak for her and uh that means a lot and i'm sure it means so much to her too so thank you for coming thank you you, you did great. my loss is your gain <laughs> <laughs> no, i'm you truly did great. truly honored thank you thank you so much you may step away um is there anybody else there or online that would like to testify on behalf of the nominee hearing none is there anyone there or online that would like to testify against the nominee Hearing none, I will now um, ask Attorney Buxton to make her um, statement, opening statement to us, and welcome. Glad to see you. Thank you, Councillor Duff. Uh, good morning, Councillors. Good morning. I am honored to be here. Now, I know that almost every nominee comes before you and uses the word of uh, being humble and honored, but I can tell you that I am certain that it is because those are the only two words that can act, uh, accurately capture what it feels like to be nominated. I have to first thank the governor and the lieutenant governor for the honor and the confidence. I have to offer my thanks to Bob Ross and Lauren Green you know, for their very professional guidance through this process. And I'd like to thank each of you for your commitment, for meeting with me, answering questions, asking questions. And this is a very important process. And I can see as I stand here towards the end of it that it is taken with tremendous seriousness as it should be, because this is an awesome responsibility you are considering giving to me on behalf of the Commonwealth as a nominee to the bench. My son Ryder is here with me today. He is 17. He is a uh, junior at St. John's Prep in Danvers. He is an honor roll student athlete. He loves soccer and hockey. He is the absolute greatest joy of my life. Probably doesn't know it, but he inspires me to be the best version of myself every day for him and for our family. Uh, this past 10 months, uh, so many things that are special and important to him have been either paused or eliminated. And I can say with tremendous pride that he has demonstrated an indomitable spirit to make the best of everything. And what that reassures me as a mother um, and as part of the community that has gone through this pandemic is that there will be a silver lining at the end of this dark cloud. And one of those is going to be the value and the lesson of perseverance. I'm very proud of him for that. <clears throat> I've been fortunate to live in Ipswich and Marblehead for the past, well, Ipswich the past 20 years, and I grew up in Marblehead. I was raised by my mother and with the help of my grandparents. My grandfather worked for about 50 years as a chemist for the Salem and Brayton Power pl uh, Plant, and he was book smart, and he liked to lecture his friends, his family, and any neighbors that would listen on all things politics and on his way of doing things. 
Truth be told, my grandfather was a bit of a curmudgeon. I believe him to be the only person other than Ebenezer Scrooge to actually use the phrase bah humbug. Others found him to be tough to get along with, but under his prickly exterior, he was actually extremely soft-hearted. My grandmother was soft-hearted on the outside and the inside. She taught me to love reading through weekly trips to the library. She taught me to love the Bruins, watching every game, every season. And she taught me how to get along with curmudgeons. My most beautiful mother was a single working mother from the time I was a toddler. She is a fiercely determined and capable woman. Although my father was a partner at a large law firm, she chose to be self-sufficient. She worked not in pursuit of a career for herself, although she was more than capable of that. She worked to provide a good home and to give me an education able to provide me with a private high school and college education, even though that was very difficult to afford despite scholarships. Somehow she did it and I, it proved invaluable to me and I am so grateful to her. My mother, just for a moment, I must praise her. She is a kaleidoscope of talents. She's a gardener who knows the Latin and English names of every plant in her garden and yours. She's a self-taught gourmet cook, a lover of antiques, a self-taught craftswoman. She can reupholster an antique chair, rewire light fixtures, use a router, a circle saw, make stained glass windows, silversmith's jewelry, who despite no college degree, shames us in jeopardy in the Sunday crossword puzzles, who is a rescuer of all injured creatures, great and small, human and animal, and who is now on her third battle with cancer. When I told her I'd been nominated, she said she was so proud and that God let her survive in order for her to be here for this moment. I'm glad that this moment has come, and I was tremendously grateful for the pride that showed on her face when I told her that information. I cannot account for all the things that my mother has taught me. Uh, the core of what she has taught to me, however, are, and she has taught me this through example, are to be determined, to be diversely capable, to be fiercely hardworking, to be willing to make personal sacrifices for the good of others. This one may be more than others, to be quick to help when needed and to be both empathic and compassionate. My mother also brought me my wonderful stepfather, Bill. She brought him into my life when I was in college. He is now a retired bank executive that enjoys skiing and sailing. Uh, but there are two things that he has taught me that are important and that I've brought to my profession. One is to listen and genuinely listen. The other is to always uh, value and use good humor, whether it's in agreement or whether it's in conflict. My own father was a Harvard law educated Iowa farm boy. He lived on the opposite coast in San Francisco where I was born. When I was 16, he re-entered my life. Uh, in my view, I gained something later in life. I hadn't lost something earlier in life. From his view, it was a regret of time lost, which I think is the viewpoint of a parent and an older uh, individual. It may have come late and it lasted too short as he passed away my first year of law school, but I am so grateful that it was later and not never. So from this family quilt that I have just described to you, I stand before you now as the person that I am, as someone able to persevere when needed, to look below the surface of people to what lies beneath, to get along with others, even the curmudgeon, to work and be capable in many things, to listen and to apply patience and good humor, even in conflict, and to know that the time is always right to do what is right. Equally important to the person that I am is who I am as a professional. I am a career prosecutor for 24 years. I have 24 years of courtroom experience. 21 of those have been in the Superior Court where I've tried nearly 100 cases before more than 20 different judges. I have tried complex cases. I have tried cases except against some of the uh, best criminal defense attorneys, in my opinion, in the Commonwealth. And it has been to my enjoyment and my enrichment that I have had that experience. I am well versed in motions practice, the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence. I do understand the mechanics of the courtroom and the interconnected roles of the personnel that comprise the engine of the trial court system. I have observed and therefore had the benefit of learning from uh, many very excellent judges. I would work hard to emulate those judges and to uh, emulate their excellence and to do the job effectively. 
In addition to my experience in the trial court, I do believe I demonstrate a good temperament to be a good judge. I am told I have the reputation for being fair, straightforward, and congenial. I have advocated strongly when I've needed to, but I've always respected my adversary's roles and I've always respected the rights of the accused. I have never once introduced myself in court as Kristen Buxton on behalf of the Commonwealth without feeling the ethical weight and the civic duty of those words. I would bring those same traits of fairness and respect and dignity to the role of a judge if this council deems that I am fit for that job. It would be my greatest honor to serve as an associate justice, to continue in public service, to contribute and have a positive impact within the trial court system and the communities it serves. And I thank you for your consideration. Counselor, I'm gonna call on will be Counselor Terrence Kennedy. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, I don't have questions, uh, a few comments. Um, I have uh, known you, I think, for the whole, your whole career as a prosecutor. Uh, and over the last two and a half decades, have had a number of cases with you. I think we had one about a year, a year and a half, two years ago, that uh, was able to finish up in a fair way. Uh, and uh, I agree with everything that was said here today, that you were an extremely fair, even-handed person. I, I have uh, one of the concerns that my colleagues and I have had, and you've heard it over the years, is putting too many prosecutors on the bench and whether they take that prosecutorial hat off and, and fair and impartial. And I, I can tell everybody here that there's absolutely no question you can do that. I've seen it every day of your career. Every day I've seen you in court. You started in district court and in. I think your nomination is a home run and, and I'm voting. Hey, I'm going to step out for a minute because I have, I have to zoom in over to it. So I'll be right back. Thank you, Councillor Kennedy. When you moved it. Councillor Ionella, do you have any questions? Can you hear me? I can now. Oh, super. I, I can hear you. Thank you. You're doing a great job, by the way, uh, Councillor. Thank you, sir. Uh, I don't have any questions. I had a lengthy conversation with the nominee. Uh, it was a pleasure to speak with her. I told her my concern about her being a prosecutor. Uh, but I feel pretty good. Uh, I think she has a nice demeanor. She has a nice temperament. And I think she's going to be a great addition uh, to the Superior Court. And when her name comes before the council, I assume next week, I'd be more than happy to vote for her. Thank you, Councilor Ionella. Councilor Jubinville. I think Councilor, you're muted, Bob. Yeah, can you turn your mic on? I got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, Ms. Coxton. Good morning. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of having a case with you, I, I don't believe. Um, but let me ask you, uh, you you're going to go into a completely new role now that you haven't had in your, your entire legal career. Uh, how are you going to be able to make that change from a prosecutor to an independent and objective judge? I believe that I, as a prosecutor, have a reputation for being fair and balanced. And um, I would bring those same traits to the different role as a judge. As a prosecutor, I advocate as a uh, partisan in an adversary system. And as a judge where I would be called upon to adjudicate, um, I would no longer be advocating. I would be adjudicating. But I would bring those same qualities that I believe I've um, demonstrated as a prosecutor to that role. Well, you're going to be probably uh, sitting in cases where people you worked with in the DA's office are going to be coming before you making requests in motions of different nature. 
how are you going to be able to handle that and when you've worked with these people for so long that uh, now they come into court a, pro a defense lawyer might feel that they got the edge i have never had um any hesitation to disagree with my colleagues if i take a different position it is um not something that uh, it i don't approach a conversation even among colleagues that are within my office as if we are um, aligned and a team and have a uh, total allegiance to opinion, viewpoints, and approaches. Uh, in fact, as a supervisor um, in a uh, supervisory type role in my office and in my most recent role within the office as um, chief homicide prosecutor, I can tell you that there are often times where I don't agree um, and I'm more than comfortable stating my disagreement with my colleagues. I do not believe that my um, time in the district attorney's office uh, means that I would become a district attorney uh, that uh, wore a robe. I believe that, it's, that um, I would be very committed and truly committed to the new role that this council may uh, bestow upon me. Um, and I don't believe that disagreement is conflict. I think there's um, uh, like minds can disagree. And I don't, I don't believe with the exception of a few colleagues who certainly for the appearance of impropriety, if no other reason, I would not be comfortable handling cases of theirs. But um, I, I would apply the facts as I knew them and the law neutrally um, and uh, in each case. And so I don't believe that I, that my career as a prosecutor would influence that. You're gonna be required sometimes to make real hard calls uh, on the bench concerning prosecutors and defense lawyers sometimes that are uh, accused of misconduct issues. Are you gonna be able to make those hard calls? I can tell you that in my years, I, that being a prosecutor is um, a job that requires, has required me to make incredibly hard calls on a routine basis. It is very hard to look at the parents of a small child who, um, we believe has been sexually or physically abused and tell that family that there's insufficient evidence to hold the abuser accountable. That um, those are hard decisions. They go against the humanity. Um, they um, are decisions that I have to make because my um, obligation ethically and as a, a lawyer requires it. But I don't know that I can think of anything harder than looking at parents of an injured child and telling them that um, there will be no prosecution and there will be no charges. It is one of the parts of my job that has been most challenging. Um, I also um, have, through, as a prosecutor, had to make difficult calls um, all the time, all the time. So um, I, feel strongly about the profession, whether it's law enforcement, prosecutor's office, the law in general. If there's evidence of misconduct, I'm committed to the system, not the individual. And so I would not have difficulty making a decision in those cases. Have you read the case of Commonwealth versus Cotto, C-O-T-T-O? I don't believe so, but I don't know it by name, but I might know it by substance. It's a case involving the Farouk uh, drug scandal in Amherst, Massachusetts. And it's Judge Carey's 127 page decision on the conduct and, and parts of it are the conduct of the two attorney generals that handled the case. I do now. Did you read it? I did not read all 127 pages, I will confess. I certainly read um, most of it. I read uh, excerpts of it, and I am familiar with the content of it, but I couldn't tell you that I read each and every of the 127 pages. Let me just uh, take from that decision a couple of, uh, a couple of sentences. Um, 
wherein the judge says the defendants were more uh, were more controversial. Uh, the, defend, the defendants' more controversial allegations that the AGs committed egregious governmental misconduct by, rehold, by, by withholding from them exculpatory evidence about the scope of Farrakh's misconduct. They then go on, he then goes on to say, and they were talking about mental health worksheets that were found in the automobile of, of the uh, chemist that showed that the extent of her misconduct went back years before uh, years before than was asserted by the attorney general's office uh, and, and others that investigated the case out there. And the judge says the attorney general's office patently baseless defenses for its withholding of exculpatory evidence. Most recently and surprisingly in 2017 the AG Deny, the AG's office denies having had any legal obligation to turn over the mental health worksheets to district attorneys because the attorney general's office had not prosecuted the defendants. This position is at odds with the fundamental principles of fairness. Equally groundless are the attorney general's assertions that it had a good faith basis for believing the mental health worksheets were privileged. Were that true, the Attorney General's office should have given them to Judge Kinder as ordered on September of 2013 for his in-camera review. Instead, the Attorney General's office deceived Judge Kinder into believing there were no privileged documents for him to review on the ruse that the AG's office had turned over all documents. Foster's letter, one of the AG's, essentially violated Judge Kinder's order. Uh, he goes on to say that the misrepresentations did not stop in 2013. I do not credit as Merrick's 2016 testimony relied upon by the Attorney General's office feigning that she forgot about the mental health worksheets and erroneously assumed that they had been turned over. He goes on to say uh, that Kaczmarek knew the mental health worksheets were exculpatory admissions by Farrakh and that the drug lab defendants were entitled to them. The Attorney General's office did not turn over the drug lab uh, to the drug lab defendants and that had no intent and had no intention of doing so. Uh, he indicates because Merrick and Foster's conduct is reprehensible, magnified by the fact that it was not limited to an isolated incident, but a series of calculated misrepresentation. Um, as a result, uh, defendants spent more time incarceration than they would have. Uh, in all my 42 years of practicing criminal law, I've never read a, a case that, that had that kind of wording in it. Have you? Not that specific wording. I've certainly read cases where there was um, remarks of uh, on misconduct in the individual case, but no. I have it not. took a lot of courage, in my view, for Judge <coughs> Carey to make those statements in print in a, in a uh, published finding of fact to his case. So my credit, my question to you is, if that had happened in your courtroom, or let's say it happened in your courtroom after you've been on for a few years, would you, would you have the fortitude to make those kind of straightforward comments about what had happened? I think you would find that if I determined there had been gross misconduct and intentional and egregious misconduct, that I would speak quite strongly to that misconduct. Well, I like hearing that. Uh, let me ask you another uh, question. Have you read or are you aware of the investigation that Judge Gantz asked the Harvard Law School to do on the issue of systemic racism in our court system. I am. Uh, what do you think of it? 
I, I, what do I think? If you're asking me, um, what the do findings, I think the, the findings significance of, that, of it? Findings of that report. So the findings of that report um, uh, say to me that there is uh, research data to show that Massachusetts also is a trial court system where there are racial disparities in sentencing that are unaccounted for by other factors. Um, that Massachusetts uh, and its trial court system um, is similar to other studies about other states um, in that it has these um, inexplicable disparities that are based on race. And that um, I think my takeaway from it really as a personal practitioner is that it is the very um, illustration of what implicit versus explicit racial bias is. Maybe people didn't see it day to day. Maybe you don't see it in your individual court. Maybe you don't see it in your individual county, but the data um, direct that is, um, and the information that informs us from that study is that whether we see it on a day to day, court to court, county to county basis, that um, the data suggests that it's it is real and that it is um, uh, something that needs to be corrected. Um, let me just uh, quote a couple things from that study and then ask you a question. According to the 2016 data, Massachusetts Sentencing Commission, 655 of every 100,000 black people in Massachusetts are in prison. Meanwhile, the state locks up 82 of its white citizens per 100,000. That's quite a discrepancy when black people make up about, I think it's uh, about 17% of our population. How do you account for that in our system? Or, or do you have any? Do you have an idea as to how you, how we got there? I can't account for it, and I um, can't opine on how we got here. Um, I, but I can um, answer your question in um, this way, which is that um, how and why we got or how we got here um, is, of course, an important question, but. The real question is, what do we do from this point forward? Um, you, I, I do believe, um, as people within that work within the justice system, that um, that we would have to ignore sort of wave after wave of the incoming tide of data on issues of uh, issues of racial disparity um, to ignore what this uh, study tells us. I think what um, the important part of this study is to um, set a course of action and what to do as a result of it. Um, well, who is the only, uh, what is the only group of people in Massachusetts that can send somebody to prison? The judiciary on behalf right. of, and, and the uh, prosecuting offices from both the federal well, they can and the recommend state level. It. They can recommend it, but somebody in a role has to send a citizen to a prison. Correct, correct. So I guess that's how we got there by judges putting more black people in jail for proportion to the $100,000, uh, 100,000 uh, people index than white people. So the question is why? In this study, they looked at they looked at all kinds of reasons and studied all kinds of reasons why these things are happening. And they they came up with one one word and only one word. Take a guess at what word that is. Racism. One hundred percent correct. They point out in the study. It's not that black people are criminals. It's that cops think black people are criminals. Uh,
Black people are charged with higher offenses usually than white people. They don't get bailed as much as white people or the bail isn't as low as much as white people. With regard to gun charges, black people are sentenced to jail much more than white people who have the same gun charges. Black people serve 168 days longer of a percentage than a sentence for a white person. Uh, do you think racism has seeped into our system for so long that sometimes we don't even recognize it happening in courtrooms? I believe that's why the issue of implicit bias versus explicit bias is what is um, at the forefront of people's concerns right now. Have you ever had any uh, uh, training on, on um, recognizing racism? Uh, yes, my office has done uh, implicit bias training uh, for well, the good. members of the office. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, do you think every judge should have to go through that program? I think every person should have to go through that, pers that program. I don't believe racism is limited to the trial court system, although that's our topic um, for this procedure. I think that um, it is broader than just the system, and so I would say that each and every person could benefit from information from that, um, that education. Do you think that a judge, when he's sentencing or she is sentencing somebody, should look at their prior record? I do. Why? Because it contains information. I believe a judge should look at all information um, and as much information as that judge can because each case, each party, each situation is uh, unique to itself. It's, there's an individual, whether it's an individual entity or an individual um, accused. So information is critical to, for a judge to be able to do a judge's job. That being said, a record alone um, isn't just something that I think, um, it, it's not some quantitative um, piece of information. There's a lot of qualitative information that can be included in a criminal record. Um, I can. There are criminal records that might be um, informative to me in making a decision if it's a criminal case based on sentencing, and there could be a criminal record in which it, get, it provides me very little information about the individual. Um, so yes, I think it should be considered um, as a matter of good practice. Um, as in addition to some of the statutory requirements at different um, portions of a of a case where the judge is asked to look at that data but i don't think it's the end it, it's not the only thing and certainly um, the record doesn't necessarily give all the information i very frequently hear judges ask usually directed at the defense attorney because the defense attorney can speak to the person to, um, to find out more about what's on the record, um, find out about a particular case. Um, and, I, and I credit that, I think that's good practice. The judge isn't just looking at um, the, the particular statute that the person was accused of violating. They're wanting to know um, the qualitative information that um, is underlying that charge. And that's the real issue. I mean, a judge's job in sentencing is to deter, to punish, and to rehabilitate. And I do think the information in a record can be helpful. I used to think so too. Uh, I don't know about it now though, because on the issue of, of uh, racism, I think minority people before the court usually have longer records um, than white people before the court because they interact more with police in their communities. They get records more than white people do in their white communities. So they get punished harder by judges because of those that record. 
I, th I think the answer to that is not to remove the information that is contained in a criminal history, but to add to that analysis and that evaluation, um, the issues that you're discussing and to try it, and to look for that, identify it and consider it. Um, where did the person come from? Where did they grow up? And that type of um, analysis. So I would just, um, I think the better practice would be to look at the record, not eliminate it, but particularly in light of the issues that have been brought to light to um, weigh these other considerations and factors into that analysis. Do you think, uh, do you think rehabilitation is going on in our jails, in our, in our prison? I certainly hope so. I think there are, um, I think it succeeds in some cases and fails in others. Well, I have to say, I don't believe there is any restitution. I mean, any re uh, rehabilitation of Con any value. I'm I'm sorry, Council Jubinville, the Lieutenant Governor is about to get on uh, so we can do our, our assembly and then we'll pick up as soon as is that so uh, okay. is that is done. So I'm sorry to interrupt you. No problem. I just got a message that she's getting on. Okay. Thank you. All right. Stand by. Okay. All right, so let's convene our assembly today. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a very special day in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as we celebrate the birthday of Joe Ferreira. <laughs> be, be mindful of that as you uh, continue on with your endeavors. Thank you, Governor. Your, your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Councilor Ferreira for a motion to record advice and consent for the financial warrant. So move, Governor. Second. There's a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 I recognize Councillor Duff for a motion to record advice and consent for the pending list of notaries, public, and justices of the peace. So move, Governor. There's a motion. Second. A second. There's a second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. We have two nominations today. William Travon Bailey has been nominated to the position of Associate Justice of the Cambridge District Court. That falls within your district, Councillor Jubinville. Okay, can we have, and we have anything next week at 10? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Let's, okay. Can we, have, can we have that day? 10 a.m. Uh, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Okay, that would be February 3rd, uh, 10 a.m. And we have Maureen Mulligan, who has been nominated to the position of Associate Justice of the Superior Court. Councilor Giovanni, this is in your district. Um, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. What is the uh, date for the other nominee? It's February 3rd at 10 a.m. February 3rd. Okay, uh, then it would be um, February 10th at um, 11 o'clock. Okay, so Maureen Mulligan, uh, February 10th at 11 a.m. Okay, that concludes our assembly today. I wanna to thank you all for your work that is underway. I can see that in the uh, Great Hall. That's terrific. I wish you all well. Uh, we've obviously had some significant announcements over the course of these past couple of years. So just stay at it, keep working hard, be healthy, uh, be well, be safe, and be happy for Pleasure. your colleague, Joe Thank Ferreira. You. Thank you. That concludes our business today. Happy birthday, Joe. Thank you very Thank much, you. Joe. Thank you, Governor. Happy birthday, Joe. Thank you all. Happy birthday, Joe. Thanks, Bob. Okay, uh, councilors, uh, since we're adjourned, do, does anyone need to take a, a bathroom break or anything, or does the nominee? No, thank you, councilor. Okay, then, no. then let's continue onward. Yeah, I don't have much more. Okay, thank you, councilor. 
I don't see the nominee. Yeah. There she is. Yeah. There okay. she is. <laughs> okay. Uh, Come. So I, my last question was, do you think there's a rehabilitation going on in the prisons? And I think you said there is some going on. Did you hear him? Or you hope there was some? So my answer is, I certainly would hope so. Um, that's the, that is one of the goals. I know there are some studies out there that discuss um, positive results of in residential in custody treatment, at least in the first couple of months. Um, after someone is released. I don't feel that I have um, enough data to make um, any broad opinions about it, but I certainly hope so. And I would say anecdotally that um, when individuals that I've been involved with by handling cases against them and they've come out of incarceration and completed certain programs go on to succeed on probation. So I would like to think that that shows that there's been some benefit um, to the individual through the program they um, completed in, in the system. Okay. Do you think somebody that has committed a uh, nonviolent crime on another should be locked up in a, in a cage? Uh, I do believe that there are crimes of persistent theft that um, mm -hmm. do require imprisonment at some point in time, yes. I have certainly handled cases where an individual has repeatedly broken into people's homes or vehicles um, or um, uh, businesses and stolen large amounts of money um, uh, time and time again. And I do believe that those crimes do merit um, uh, uh, punishment either in the jail or the prison system at some yeah, point no, in I, time. I consider them violent crimes. I'm talking about a, a non-violent crime. In other words, no, no damage to property and no injury to anybody else. So uh, if the type of crimes that, that you're, you have in mind are the motor vehicles and the possessory crimes, uh, those types. Again, each case is different, and somebody with some with chronic behavior is in a different light than someone who has offended for the first time. But as a general rule, depending on what type of cases you're referring to, I don't know that I think that that is necessarily the right punishment for that type of behavior. But I would have to look at each case and consider each, um, right. each one on its own. Well, we have technology today, so you can lock somebody up in their house with a bracelet or another device and uh, know where he is at all times. And, and rather than the taxpayers paying 50,000 bucks a year to keep them in a locked facility, they can do it, be kept in their own home, right? Correct. I, I do think technology is opening up options um, that are beneficial to the system and beneficial to the taxpayer and that right. should be um, effective, yes. Yeah, especially when Massachusetts is uh, trying to is way down in its um, its income, and we need to save every dollar we can save. Every inmate salary, every keeping an inmate in jail for a year is a salary of a state employee. Uh, let me ask you about sentencing guidelines. What do you think of those? So I had a unique um, role in that. In that, in 1996, when they generated the data that was incorporated in the 96 guidelines and um, and was a foundation for the more recent revisions. Um, I was uh, a new assistant DA at the Essex County District Attorney's Office working for Kevin Burke and Judge, uh, well, then Assistant District Attorney Jane Haggerty. Um, now, I believe she's, um, I don't know if she's retired or not, but she went on to the Superior Court. I was tasked with being the individual from our office that collected the data to be used in the guidelines. And my job, once I was Corey certified, was to review all of the files in our office that had been disposed and to um, um, rate each case based on the most serious offense charge and the sentence that was given. 
And I will tell you that I have made this argument repeatedly before the sentencing appeals on my cases over the past 21 years, which is that I believe the information that went into the sentencing guidelines, however well intended they are for the purposes that are promulgated, um, but I, I had a unique vantage point in that I helped to collect the data. And I know that the data does not distinguish between a single offense and a diverse offense whether a person um, yeah, underlying a single charge did it one time or a hundred times. I know that the data does not distinguish between the age of a, um, of a sexual assault victim, whether they're three or 15 and, and 11 months. So I have always approached those guidelines in my role as a prosecutor um, with a sort of an educated eye that some of the data underlying it um, was was perhaps the best that could be obtained at the time, but presents some defects in um, the data itself. So long answer, I apologize. I, per I, I, I personally don't agree with them. I haven't agreed with them as a prosecutor. I think the best thing um, that a judge can do is use their wisdom, their experience, their information, and make an individualized determination. Um, on each and every case. I'm, I'm sorry, Councilman. God bless you. I mean that. First of all, the legislative body in Massachusetts, in my view, is the only body that can set a crime uh, in the statutes and the only body that can set a penalty to that crime. The court system has no authority to do that. The Sentence Guideline Commission has no authority to do that. And uh, the legislature hasn't adopted any of their work. And, and I make this objection every time, usually it's Superior Court that, that uses them, but I make the same objection every time I'm before a judge when they're brought up. In addition to that, I think they're terribly unfair in this regard. The Commonwealth gets to determine the charges to a defendant. Some counties charge higher in certain things than other counties do. And that sets, that sets the bar for these guidelines. So I think it's slanted, slanted to the government. They make the, ch they make the charge, they're free to make certain charges in certain ways and i think it's terribly unfair to a defendant uh to even discuss them and i know judges tell me well mr juvenile it's just an advisory but it's more than that whenever they're thrown out that's just seems to be the starting point if it's three and a half years that's where the, the discussion starts from going up or down uh if they benefit the prosecution, they bring it up. If they benefit the defense bar, they bring it up at a certain level. So I like your answer very much. Uh, I agree with you. Judge Harrington in the federal court refused to sentence anybody under those draconian guidelines they, they used for almost 20 years that were so abusive to the citizens of this country. Why this state of Massachusetts and our court system would even discuss guidelines about what happened down in that building in the waterfront is beyond me. So I like you. I like your answer a lot. Uh, I won't keep you. I did. Uh, I did uh, get some, uh, as I indicated to you, Judge uh, Lawyer Jimmy Krasnow called me about you unsolicited. He had a case with you and he was so impressed with the way you behaved as a DA, he went on and on about you. Uh, Judge Chapman called me also, speak, well, spoke very highly of you. Uh, Counselor Kennedy also uh, let me know about the interaction he had with you over the years, all of it positive. Uh, I got a letter from Bernie Grossberg, a longtime criminal defense lawyer who wrote a very, very fine letter on your behalf. I, I think it's in your file or gonna go in your file. Um, 
If it's not in there, we'll make sure it goes in there. And uh, of course, I got a call from uh, the finest captain that ever served on the state police, Captain McDonald. And I hear he's an excellent driver. <laughs> I only wish he was as good to me as he was to you. Uh, but his 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 uh, recommendation goes a long way with me, uh, with towards me and what I think of you. So uh, I won't tell you how I'm voting, but I think you can figure it out. Uh, I think you did a great job at this hearing, and thank you for answering my question. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor. I think you muted, Eileen. Couldn't hear you. Councilor, Councilor Fierro, do you have questions? Thank you. I can hear you now. Thank you All very right. much, Councilor. I appreciate uh, the way you're running this meeting. It's going very smoothly. Um, Thank you, I sir. say that uh, I had the opportunity to speak in length the other day with the nominee. Uh, it was great to uh, speak with her, learn about her. As it turns out, uh, she spent a lot of time swimming in the waters of Somerset when her grandfather worked at the power plant. And uh, I served 30 years there in the police department, nine as chief. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I appreciate what you've done for the Commonwealth as a DA, um, you know, as a court prosecutor and filled all the roles from patrolman through chief. And it's very important to have great DAs. So I appreciate your service to the Commonwealth. I particularly uh, took interest in the case that you tried regarding the uh, Chinese restaurant owner. I know you got a double murder conviction over a period of months that you tried that case, which is remarkable. Um, so thank you on, on behalf of all the people in the Commonwealth for the work you've done over the uh, last two and a half decades. Thank you, um, also, um, as Councillor Jewelville said, I also uh, received some outreach. Councillor Kennedy is a huge fan. He twisted my arm from day one saying, you better vote yes on, on this one. Uh, Judge Chapman, Randy Chapman, uh, reached out to me, sent me a nice email saying he has the highest respect and regard for you. So uh, you and I talked about the civil stuff a little bit, and I'm sure you'll get up to speed quickly. I told you my concerns about uh, some people wanting continuances and the cases being tried five years later on the civil side, especially medical malpractice cases, and I hope you wouldn't grant all those continuances for two years at a time uh, for the poor plaintiffs out there. But um, I will tell you how I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote yes next week, and I think you're going to be a great judge. So congratulations for the nomination. Thank you for your service, and I wish you the best. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Fiera. We we do a good job up here in Essex County. You do. I'm very <laughs> impressed. I'm in Essex. Uh, yes. Is Councillor Hurley with us? Yes, I am. Councillor Hurley, I'd like to invite you to question the nominee. Thank you. Um, can you see me? Because I cannot, but I can hear you. Okay. I don't know what's going on. I've, I've got a, the video going, but it's obviously not working. Um, That's all right. I had an opportunity to talk to uh, Attorney Buxton uh, twice. I also received a phone call from her boss, um, who thinks that you are the second coming uh, in terms <laughs> of your ability as a trial lawyer and as um, a person. Um, I've checked you out with some of my contacts and um, they all rave about you. So I think that really um, you're gonna be a, a great asset to the, the uh, bench. And uh, I don't think you're gonna get black robe syndrome. Um, there are an awful lot of judges who don't. Um, and I think you're gonna be one of them. So um, we talked, I am more than satisfied with your abilities and your competency and um, most of all, your humanity. So I really don't have any other questions. I think um, Councilor Jubinville, as always, did an excellent job in um, asking you the questions that I would have asked. So uh, I intend to support your nomination and vote for you next week. Thank you very much. Oh, Councilor Hurley, thank you so much. Uh, Councilor Devaney, would you like to ask some questions? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm nice to see you again. Nice to Thank see you, you again. for your time. Um, four hours and it didn't seem it. It was wonderful. I, um, I meet with everyone because um, I'm voting for the whole person, not, not just these papers or 
letters or whatever, and I really got to know you. Um, first of all, I do want to mention that um, I, I got a great call from Judge Chapman, and um, it was nice to get a call from someone who I highly respect and, and voted for, and he's doing a great job. Um, I, uh, we, we got um, letters, and um, I wanted to ask you about some of these things because, I mean, you have had, uh, in 25 years, rapes, murders, robberies, child abuse, uh, home invasions. Um, I mean, there is, you've covered it all, you know? I mean, I, I haven't seen anyone with an application like this, and I have to tell you, we need you on the Superior Court. This council four years ago voted for someone who had six trials in 21 years in Superior Court. We need you. We need you to be a mentor. You should be there. You should be there. not someone jumping a line because they know someone. But the point is that um, the people that wrote letters to you were very specific. And they talked about seeing your demeanor and seeing your fairness and your ability as, as a lawyer. And um, I just want to give you the opportunity to talk on some of that. Um, Attorney uh, Grossberg, uh, about the Saifa Lee case. Could you tell us about that? So that is a case that um, was a co-defendant case that Counselor uh, Ferreira just referenced. It was <clears throat> just a, a horrific case in which three men traveled to my actually, actually my hometown in the middle of the night and went into a closed restaurant where the owner, a lovely man who had um, been married to his wife for decades, had raised two um, lovely uh, adult boy, uh, men at the time this happened, and he in the course of trying to rob the restaurant of what they believed to be a large amount of money contained within, they encountered the victim um, who was um, in the restaurant having worked such long hours that he slept in the back um, uh, rather than return um, to his home down in Quincy. And um, the uh, he was brutally beaten in the course of that failed robbery and left and died as a result. And it was one of the most uh, um, uh, difficult cases to handle because uh, of a number of factors. But I think what stands out about that case and, the, and why people talk about it when they talk about me is that the trial of it uh, endured over just over five months. We tried each defendant separately for reasons related to uh, the efficient availability of the correct interpreters uh, that the that each of the defendants required. And because we tried the cases separately, one trial lasted about two months and one about three months. So I think the reason people talk about that is um, between the systemic issues, the interpreter issues, um, some of the uh, legal and factual issues that were raised during the trial, it was really, in addition to being an, a, a horrific case um, and a most um, violent um, crime, even amongst murders, um, it was the, about the endurance and the stamina that it took to um, try those cases to their end conclusion. And even the judge who presided over those cases, who has been before this council uh, three times and who is widely considered to be of uh, the most excellent, one of the most excellent judges. And I found him to be um, certainly a most excellent, patient, and fair trial attorney. It even tested his patience. Um, it really was, as I wrote in my uh, application, if there was a case to sort of break down um, your stamina uh, and your composure, it was this case. And so, um, but I um, believe that it is referred to often because myself and my, my co-counsel 
um, Captain McDonald that was referenced earlier by Councillor Ferreira um, and the, um, the prosecution team, not just the lawyers, but the investigators, the whole team and the family um, were able to um, put aside our frustrations and our own personal physical and mental fatigue and see it through uh, to the end. And so um, I will um, always remember that trial for the, the sort of the test of, of, of uh, physical and mental um, agility and composure that it presented. Well, I, I have to tell you, um, I think what we are uh, experiencing now and what we're seeing in decisions in some of these courthouses we really need someone with your experience. And um, I feel very strongly if, um, if is an attorney that's appointed as a judge and has had no criminal experience, he'll be in, that person would be indecisive in sentencing and even timid. And I think, and one of the things that you pointed out that is very important for a judge is decisiveness. And um, uh, I think that's lacking if you don't have criminal experience. And again, we're living in very dangerous times. I mean, just a few streets away from me last week, a man in a road rage killed a man. So, I mean, it's constant. Uh, and so I, I just feel that we do in this, in this time of all times, we need that. And um, in one of my constituents sent a letter um, in, uh, what's her name? in, no, Carol Ann Hillis. And, and she said something that I thought was important that um, about your compassion, how you help others. And I know in the Superior Court, the judges work together. That's very, very important. And, um, and she said, that she worked with you at the district attorney's office. So she's known you for 25 years. So when the new lawyers or interns needed help, it was frequently attorney Buxton who stayed and assisted after the workday ended. She was the go-to person for many prosecutors and police and for guidance, it goes on like that. And so, you know, in all through all of the recommendations of the people that I talked to, fair-minded, respect for integrity, and she never forgets the rights of the accused and compassionate, my word, compassionate and empathy. And so those are the things, you know, that I see about you. And um, I'm not going to read all the letters, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't read um, someone from our highest court, and we don't always hear from Judge Lowy. And um, he has said that he has never, never uh, recommended anyone. So well, it's quite a thing. And he said, um, Kristen Buxton is an extraordinary trial lawyer. She will be a phenomenal Superior Court judge. She tried her first case before me in 1997 when I was a District Court judge. She tried her last case, three month murder trial. And when we met before I was, I think you said it was five months, right? Five, five months, months, five months. Before me in 2016. Between those times, I would estimate that she tried more than 25 cases in which I presided. Based on that experience, I believe you could not do better than to confirm the governor and Lieutenant Governor's nomination of Ms. Buxton to be an Associate Justice of the Superior Court. She combines brilliance with common sense, fierce preparation with empathy for everybody involved in the trial. She possesses a level of probity that is beyond reproach and is everything a prosecutor should be. She understands and abides by the words that the government, quote, the government also wins its case when justice is done. So many are the instances of Ms. Buxton ensuring that a defendant was getting a fair trial that I cannot count them all. By way of example, I recall numerous times 
Ms. Buxton raised the issue of a defendant's right to a lesser included offense, uh, did not object to evidence that might have been inadmissible under our law of evidence because she knew it was important evidence for the defendant. And while I'm on the subject of evidence, a topic that I have been teaching at various law schools for over 20 years, no lawyer who ever has tried cases before me understands the law of evidence better than Ms. Buxton. And that's not even a close call. Ms. Buxton knows everybody in the courthouse. She is always considerate of the courthouse staff and is friends with many of them. Defense lawyers respect and trust her, and I expect that you will find that judges, without exception, will echo my perspective. President Clinton, in his 1996 inaugural address, said that, quote, but for fate, we the fortunate and the unfortunate might have been each other. I don't know if there is a better mantra which to take the bench with every morning. I do know that. Should she be confirmed, Miss Buxton will preside in a manner that will bring President Clinton's words to light, embodying fairness, impartiality, and restraint every day she takes the bench. I have been writing letters of recommendations for a long time now. I have never recommended anyone with more certainty and conviction that I do now for Ms. Buxton. She will be a terrific judge, and I am proud to support her nomination. Very truly yours, David A. Lowy, Associate Justice, Supreme Judicial Court. Can't get better than that. And Maureen Leal, who was a district attorney, chief victim witness advocate who has worked for you, worked with you for many years, talks about your integrity. And um, and she talked about you had two trials back to back and, um, you know, and, and you never get flustered and you had the ability never to lose your cool and stay on the task and allow the victim's family to remain secure and Kristen's skill to obtain justice on behalf of their loved ones. So um, she's well respected by everyone, core personnel and everyone. Um, you know, the letters were really uh, unbelievable. And I do want to say publicly, uh, nominees have um, people that write letters to the JNC to support their nomination. The councils are not allowed to see those letters, which I would love to see. I, I don't know why that isn't so. But, um, you know, but I, I, that's why I thought it was important to uh, especially read Judge Lowy's. But when I looked at your uh, resume, all of the people that you um, asked to call and that respect you, every one of them is so respected in the Commonwealth. I mean, I, you know, I, I recognize the names and I know them, and, it, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I do, I don't want to forget, I'd be amiss, I want to congratulate you on being chosen for the American College of Trial Lawyers, and you've been inducted in September, so congratulations, uh, well deserved. And I do want to thank you for applying again. This is your third time, and um, so many times people just go away reluctantly because they see someone less qualified that gets the job, and so they said, never mind, but you did. And we have got good people that have persisted, so I'm so glad you did. Um, I, I, I want to thank my colleague, um, Councilor Juvenville. I was going to ask you about um, sentencing guidelines. I have never, in all my years since they first proposed that, have ever heard from a lawyer that supports it. Now, um, it, it, it's not in force. It's not in force, and yet some will come before us and try to make us believe that it is. And you don't have to be a lawyer to know that's not true. But I want to give you the chance to tell me what certain crimes do you feel um, that, um, that deserve to have um, sentencing guidelines uh, separate from these guidelines? Um, you named... Um, home invasion statute, and um, 
And then, uh, so when I'm talking, why don't you tell us about that? I think um, I think if I understand the question, you're asking me about something I put on my um, governor's council questionnaire. Yes. Um, so what I what the my reference to the home invasion st statute and the armed career criminal statute is this. Um, separate and apart from the guidelines, those are two statutes which give a judge these two options: probation or 20 years or, or, or uh, well, this is the home invasion statute. There's only two choices on a conviction, probation or 20 years in state's prison. It's just impossible to rationalize that those are the, are the proper options for that crime, um, that there's no in-between. Um, now those, case, those, those statutes have been challenged through case law. They've been determined to, um, be um, intentionally uh, promulgated by the legislature, but um, sometimes this is my litmus test. If I can't explain it to my friends and family why that's the why that's the option, it makes no sense. And I don't think you need to be a lawyer to appreciate that a home invasion crime is an extremely serious crime, and there are a number of individuals of varying ages criminal backgrounds and situations that have been charged and convicted of that offense. It just defies rational um, reason that the only options are 20 years in state's prison or none. And so similar to the armed career, um, armed career criminal statute, there was recent case law that um, essentially came sentences um, are different, but essentially it's the same. They're either a mandatory minimum, very serious sentence, or probation, and nothing in between, despite all the varieties of people and offenses, facts and backgrounds um, that can be underneath those convictions. And so, um, separate and apart from the guidelines, um, it, it seems to me that there, um, I would welcome some sort of corrective legislation on those two particular offenses where the extreme options just don't seem to be well suited. So um, under the minimum mandatory, is there any, uh, anything that you would like to see that um, uh, changed or, or, or something added to that? Uh, what I'd like to see the law changed. I'd like to, um, if the legislature intended for a 20 year mandatory minimum on home invasion, then the statute should be written in order to, um, to um, affect that, whether I agree with it or not. Um, and the same thing for the armed career criminal statute, whether I agree with the mandatory minimums, whether I like the mandatory minimums, um, if the mandatory minimums are, are, are significant sentences, um, then, the, I, I, um, then the legislature should write the offenses um, as such. It just, it, doesn't it just sort of defy reason that those are the two options? And if I can't understand that as a 24-year criminal trial attorney, and if I can't understand um, and explain that to the people that the laws serve, it seems to me that there's just really this inherent irrational um, part of those two laws. And so um, I would like either they are mandatory minimums, um, whether I agree with them or not, that should be written as such and true, or they should be, um, the judge should be given the full discretion between probation and up to the maximum. That's how I, that, that's how I view that. Okay. Well, um, I have said in the past at, at hearings when this has come up, and uh, my colleagues have heard that, that um, uh, the colleagues present here weren't here. We had, uh, um, we had someone uh, come before us, and um, he had, um, under the mandatory sentencing, uh, the school zone, and uh, he was 17, and he was going to school. He was, by the way, he was 57, and he came before us for a pardon. And I'll tell you, uh, it, it it broke my heart. I, I my heart broke to listen to this man 
how his life was ruined because of that. He was 17 and he was on his way to school. And an older friend, 21, stopped him along the way, 21 years old. And uh, he said, would you do me a favor? Would you sell these bags of marijuana, $25 a bag? He gave him five bags. And he went into the school, naive, innocent, dumb. But that's what he did. He wanted to please his friend. He's a good kid, you know, um, um, played football, was going to go to college, you know, just a regular a, a kid that you would be proud to have as a son. And he foolishly went in and he sold one bag. And when he tried to sell a second bag, that student reported him. And so the principal went and found the other bags in the, the locker. It's a two year sentence, but I think initially it was five years. He got five years. So when he was before me, I just, oh, it broke my heart because it ruined his life, you know? And uh, he, um, you know, he probably would have got a scholarship. He, he didn't have, you know, dates or anything. They're 17 to 22 years old, didn't go to college. And when he came out, he got a job as a custodian in a private school. Now that private school is closed now, and he's 57 years old, even if, he didn't have that burden. Where's he getting a job at 57, you know? But, but the thing was, he's had a lot of health problems. He had cancer, he has had a leg removed. He's married, his children, very involved in his community. He's a coach, he's involved in his church. And I looked at him and I thought, how outrageous that, that he couldn't have, you know, uh, I don't know, community service, something on probation, but it just didn't merit to take his youth away, to take his life aspirations away, you know? So um, is that changing at all? Um, I, I'm not sure whether it's changing at all. Um, I would just take the opportunity to say that, you know, I understand with the mandatory minimums like you're referring to in, in that situation. I, my understanding is that mandatory minimums are statutes that are um, promulgated by the legislature, typically or historically, to correct something, something where they feel that the court system or the laws have fallen short, whether they're um, in response to um, the, the drug impact on society and the mandatory minimums with those cases or uh, some other situation. But my understanding is that as a general rule, the mandatory minimums are promulgated with an eye towards public protection and to correct something that has um, gone wrong. Oh, oh I understand the, it. Yeah, and at the same time, I think that the, and we're talking on criminal law here, which is where I've been for 24 years, it is a system about humans, human frailty, human mistakes, um, some of the darkest parts of human conduct from what I have seen as a prosecutor with my type of caseload. But every single case, every victim, every witness, every defendant um, is, is um, has their own is, is their own person. The facts are always unique, and there's a humanity to the system. Um, so I understand the promulgation of some of those laws. I understand the purposes with which they were promulgated. Again, whether I agree with them or don't agree with them, whether I believe they're working or they're not working. But on the other hand, this is a system about um, human conduct and human um, people and humanity. And so um, each case, in order to individualize it, it seems to me the best way to do that is to give judges the information they need to make the best decisions, to um, nominate and appoint good judges who will take that role very seriously and let them make a decision based on the individual case. Okay. Well, I think it, I mean, obviously it takes all discretion away from the judge. And, and there's a nice quote I think you'll like that... Um, uh, somebody reminded me of, um, and it is, each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And I believe that to be true. But I just feel, just taking that individual case, that, you know, if the judge had compassion and empathy and could have used discretion, I'm sure that they wouldn't have put him away for those years. I just, just don't think it, you know. But, you know, I'm still hoping for more pardons. We haven't had any. I haven't had any in years and years and years. And there's people out there that are um, have been in the military and work hard and marry and bring up children and community service. 
and yet, you know, they're in drawers in our, our, our office, and, and God knows, probably some of them have died. But you know what? I, I you know, I, I, we spent four hours, and it was wonderful, I, you know, to really get to know you and to know your cases. Um, tell me, what, what is the most rewarding case, if it, if it stands out in your 24 years? I can honestly tell you that I can't, I can't give you one. And this is, this is why. It, I have handled, although I, I told you I've, I've done almost 100 trials, I, I have had hundreds more that never went to trial. I have conducted hundreds of investigations that never resulted in charges. Um, I find it very difficult to rank my cases or prioritize them in that way, even though I know, um, I understand and appreciate the, the question. Something my son does to me all the time, what are your top three favorite movies? What are your top three <laughs> favorite things? And I can never even answer those yeah, questions. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you that the most rewarding thing, not one case, um, it's never been just one case. The most rewarding thing is that um, I had the good fortune of working with wonderful people. Maybe I'm one of the luckiest people in the Commonwealth, but I worked for two district attorneys that gave us um, faith, trust, and discretion uh, to do what we needed to do and to do what we believe was right. And um, I learned from some incredible prosecutors, Mr. Mitchell, I know he's gone now, has to be um, one of the best trial attorneys in the Commonwealth. And I got to learn from him um, and others. And I got to go before um, incredible judges. Uh, so uh, in fact, the judge whose uh, seat I have been nominated for, Judge Connors, was the first trial judge in the first district court that I worked in. Um, and I went, be and the others were, at the time were Judge Lowy and Judge Agnes. And we were all in the Lynn District Court together. Long answer. Um, I've had great fortune to learn from amazing people. Um, and I think that is the most rewarding thing that I have had as a professional. As a prosecutor, it's, it's more of a, it's not a thing, it's not an instance, it's not a case. It's the feeling of gratification that I've done my job, I've done it well, I've done it right. And maybe the outcome isn't exactly what a victim wanted or, um, wasn't perfect, but there's a tremendous calm satisfaction in doing your job well. Um, and the only thing I can call it is gratification. And the end of a serious case, a difficult case, when I know I've, I've, um, I've done my best and I've helped the victims through a complicated, difficult, daunting, intimidating system, it's that feeling of gratification. I think it is the, the most rewarding. Is there one that um, that is always in the back of your mind that was that was the most disappointing outcome? Uh, maybe the judge, you know, um, probably went the opposite of what you wanted the outcome to be. I've had a few of those where I simply did not agree with the final outcome in terms of in, in terms of the punishment for the crime. Um, I had one case um, that I had at the very beginning of my career, and it was a motor vehicle homicide case, and um, it was two brothers. They had been drinking. They called for a ride. They called their neighbor and best friend. The neighbor and best friend picked them up, but that person had been drinking. And so these two um, young men in college had uh, done what they're supposed to do and called for a ride, but they called the wrong person. And in the course of that trip, home, um, the, the person they called the driver drove um, at an excess speed, had been drinking by their own admission all afternoon, and um, went through a stop sign and struck a tree. And although I have dealt with um, so many victims, that family and that case will always stay with me. I, I, the jury found um, the person um, responsible of the misdemeanor, not the felony. Um, it was just that, but it was, it was the human part of that case that will stay with me forever. Um, sitting with those two parents, they lost their only two boys. And I remember the father and all of his grief, um, understandable grief. I don't need to explain to you why they were grieving. Also said, you know, that was the end of his family line. The family name ended with his two sons. And um, it's 
it's a case that has stayed with me despite so many others that are important and um, difficult. But because it was the first, it was the first where yeah. I was, I was um, working with people who were suffering from such profound grief. It was before I was ever assigned my first child well, that's rape, true sense. and before I was yeah. ever assigned my first murder trial. So it was the first, and that will stay with me for that reason. Uh, no, you mentioned that when we met. Um, and, um, tell me uh, your opinion. Do you think the age for um, people going to the juvenile court should be uh, it, it will they change it? Do you think it should they should hire it to twenty one years or whatever than so, uh, what it is now? Uh, I don't know is the answer. Um, but what I tell you, what I would say is this: that I bless you. Um, I think it's you know clearly it's brain science and the juvenile brain that um, is being reviewed, considered, and is um, helping to form the policy behind juvenile laws and um, juvenile justice. So I think that the law should follow the science, um, not necessarily sentiment or popularity, but the science behind that. And, I, and I'm familiar with some of that science. I'm not familiar enough with it um, to be able to say in what way it should be affecting um, juvenile justice policy um, and any reform. But I do believe it's a it is a um, there's a growing body of evidence on that um, that is um, something that needs to be um, considered and incorporated into that policy. Well, I, I have an opinion. Just seeing what's going on in our society, there's a lot of murders by in rapes by by teenagers, teenagers with teachers, and so forth. Um, so um, you know, I. I I think it has to be an individual case, but I wouldn't like to see it go, um, you know, further than the age that it is. I really don't, because they don't get the sentence that they deserve for a murderer, for example. Um, so um, um, tell me, would you ever, in your court, would you ever turn off a recorder? Uh, the courts of Massachusetts are a court of public record. And so if there's anything being, um, any business being conducted in the court is official business as opposed to personal conversations, then it is a court of public record. Okay, I'm going to um, talk about another case. And I investigated this thoroughly and, and, and it's, it's hard not to cry when I, when I talk about it. And that was Abigail Hanna. And for people in the public who don't know. Um, first of all, I want to make it clear. I understand everyone in our society deserves to have representation with an attorney, no matter how vile that person is. The Boston, you know, the Boston Marathon, um, you know, is still going on, and he's going to get his justice. And he's due that justice, no matter how vile his his crime was. So, given that, I understand that. So, I want to make that clear that no one thinks that I think that anyone should not be represented. Um, I want to say I have accurate information because I talked and I listened, I should say, at length to the father of the victim, this two-year-old baby girl, okay? Um, the family had hired Abigail Hanna for a babysitter. It was about two, one or two hours she babysat. The next time she never showed up, so they never had her come again. One cold winter night, they didn't know it because when they went in the morning to go into the baby's room, the baby was gone. Abigail Hanna, in the middle of the night, went into that house and kidnapped that baby. She burned her with cigarettes from head to the bottom of her feet. She shaved off her hair, all cuts over her head. She abused her. And then she left her naked 
by the side of a road. And on the other side of the road was Woods. This baby was still awake. If she had gone into the woods, it would have been a homicide. And an elderly couple drove by. And the woman said to her husband, is that a doll? And they turned around and they found her. They put clothes around her to keep her warm. I talked to the father. He talked to me. She's seven years old. She still has trouble putting on her socks in the morning because she has scars all over her body, all over her legs, all over her feet. And when this attorney, O'Neill, was representing Hannah, she asked the judge for three year sentence. Three year sentence. She's going to get out next month. She's going to get out next month. Now, the argument was she was schizophrenic. Well, she went before the parole board, not once, but twice. And they said to her, this is not the first time that you abused, tortured, sexually assaulted a child. And there are people with the same mental issue that you have that don't do those things. So guess what? The lawyer who represented of Hannah came before us. The baby's father wanted the council to vote no. They didn't want to come. They didn't want to bring attention because they didn't want reporters at their home. And they have tried, they have tried for years advocating for exploited children. And they have tried to talk to the governor and couldn't see our governor, couldn't see staff. And all they want to do is educate. And they're so knowledgeable. They found out that Abigail Hanna was going to be allowed to go out to community service. And they went to them at the department and said, do you know she's on the sexual register? So they didn't let her go. I'm not a lawyer, but I know there's a law for good conduct. And you can correct me if I'm wrong. 10 days are taken off a month. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I really do investigate. But anyway, she'll be out February. And I don't believe justice was done when you ask for three to five years. And all I wanted from the Susan O'Neill came before us to be a judge was empathy, compassion. I wanted her to say, I did my job for my, uh, my client, Abigail Hanna. I worked hard. I helped her. I advocated for her. But you know what? I had sleepless nights thinking about that baby. She never mentioned her. And when it was asked by another colleague if I was saying it correctly about her injuries, she said, no, that's not quite the way I heard it. Well, I heard it from the father. And you can't dispute a father. And he lived it. So the rest of the story is very interesting because it is a nominee that was defending that baby, that was defending that two-year-old. And you can tell us the rest of the story and what you asked the judge, what sentence you wanted, because I've said it all. And you can correct me in any way. I asked in that case um, for a sentence of not less than 10 years nor more than 15 years in state prison. And I asked for a lengthy probation to follow that included um, certain terms and uh, electronic monitoring. Um, and it was a case that I submitted a sentencing memorandum in support of that outlined all of my reasons and what I was requesting on behalf of the Commonwealth. But you know, when you say it's a small world, 
you know, we talk for four hours. And when I mention that to you, that I think of that all the time, that child will never have a normal life, what she went through. It could well have been a homicide if it wasn't for that elderly couple that came by, this freezing little naked girl by the side of a highway. And um, I thank you for, for what you did. And uh, you know, that's how it is. And the judge makes the decision. But um, all I want is empathy and compassion. And I want, and I'm very proud. I was the only counsel that voted no and I would do it again. I have no doubt in my mind, after going through all the investigation and talking to the father and looking all in as much as I could do, that she had no empathy. She wanted her out three to five years. And I thank you for the caring. So I didn't mean to prolong that, but that was one case that I, I just was amazed that when I talked about it, you said, yes, I represented that little girl. And, um, and the father says she has a lot of problems, a lot of problems. She has a sister two years older than her, too. But they do everything. They do races for children exploited and everything. All they want to do is educate this administration. All they want to do, because they don't want it to happen to any other parents, any other child. And um, God bless them for what they do. But they wouldn't come to the hearing because they didn't want that attention on their daughter again. And I understood that, you know. Um, I mean, you have cases. God love you. I don't know how you can do it. I mean, we have such a, a, a egregious society that biological fathers rape their children and, and then the mothers don't believe it. I mean, how do you, you know, what, what, you, you've had a lot of those. Now, how do you deal with that? I mean, is there any way that um, if you don't have support of, say, the wife or whatever, that you can go forward with it? There's always other sources. Well, there's not always, but often, yes, as long as there's other sources of evidence and, um, and information, then yes, you can go forward on it. And I have, both as a district court prosecutor and as a superior court prosecutor. Well, I, you know, I... Uh, I, I just thank you for all all that you do. Um, you're going to be such an asset. And and when I think of, you know, and and we had a nominee here. I mean, a witness here that talked for you, the attorney. And and he said that you know his colleagues that are judges. And I know he's probably more qualified than some of the ones that have been approved by the council. And and you know, um, you're going to be a mentor, and you take the time to help other people. And and we really need you. Not someone that has had seven, you know, seven, um, you know, trials in 21 years. You can't even count how many cases and trials you've had, and um, and I, you know, I just wish you all good luck. And um, you know, and and there's so many people out there that are, are so pleased. And and uh, you know, I don't always say, but I don't have a poker face. And I said to you, we need you. We need you. We need you to educate a judge that had seven trials in 21 years in the Superior Court. Okay, those are the things that I have to live with. I'm on the losing end on votes. I'm the tuxedo with brown shoes, I guess. But you know what? You have to do with your heart and your head and do your investigation and then make your decision whether you're going to vote yes or no. And I'll tell you, this is the best yes that I'll ever say next week. So um, I wish you all good luck. And uh, and I want to say, too, that you've been involved in your community and with your son and all of that. And so uh, I know he must be as proud as you are, proud as him. <laughs> so I'm so glad you came because this is something you'll always remember. But, uh, but thank you. It was such a pleasure that four hours flow and you are now on the Hall of Fame, Belgian Waffle. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Devaney. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello. Councillor DePaulo. Thank you, Councillor Duff. My pleasure. Uh, good afternoon, Attorney Buxton. It's nice to meet you in person, albeit distant. Good afternoon. Um, 
I'm going to be very brief because there's no need to iterate uh, your impressive experience uh, and the empathy and compassion I've heard from you and that I've heard others speak of about you. Um, and certainly the letters and uh, the testimony today, folks I've spoken to in the bar community uh, have had only good things to say about you. Um, so given that foundation, uh, you know, the only real matter to be concerned with is discretion. And so um, on that, you know, I was pleased to hear you uh, say that you prioritize uh, seeking the qualitative and contextual factors uh, from a given defendant who would be in front of you. Um, because, um, of course, we know putting a juvenile record aside, uh, a lot of folks end up in the system starting in the juvenile courts as CRAs, wildly disproportionately kids with learning disabilities, black and brown kids, kids in our foster system. Um, and so this is a one sentence digression, but since it was brought up, the science is unequivocal around brain development and child development that um, the parts of the brain that control executive functioning and impulse control, especially in males, uh, is not fully developed until well into the mid 20s. Uh, nothing that you have authority, obviously, to influence the legislature around, but something perhaps worth contextualizing in your, uh, if you were to seat uh, in the Superior Court. But I just wanted to ask you about two details that weren't brought up in the Harvard University study. And the first is, um, obviously, uh, you spoke to the sentencing disparities that we saw. It's not convictions uh, uh, that are the issue, it's the sentencing, which is what falls within the judge's uh, discretion. So accounting for all the factors that the study accounted for, we get down to about a 30-day difference between what black and brown defendants face uh, compared to white defendants. And that's Again, factoring all the context uh, that the study was able to muster. Um, so the thing about it is that the sentencing disparities are actually very, very narrow, barely statistically significant in the district court. But in the superior court, uh, according to the report, is where um, black and Latino defendants see uh, double the disparities. So that 30-day that disparity becomes 60 days disparities in the superior court. So really, um, you're gonna be where the rubber meets the road um, if the judiciary is gonna play a role in addressing some of these racial disparities. So um, while you've spoken to it in general, I wonder if you could speak to that specific phenomenon of the superior court, again, controlling for all the uh, variables seems to be where the disparities lie. Um, so if you're asking me um, what my understanding is of why that is in the Superior Court. Um, I cannot answer that um, beyond appreciating that what this study and other studies um, support is that whether or not there's any explicit intention to be biased, that there are these implicit biases that, um, that exist. And so um, and I know I've read, you know, I've read the Harvard study and I understand there were a lot of um, qualifications to the data that was used, um, for instance, by the, by the study itself, you know, that it didn't take into account certain factors. I think uh, poverty and education was one of them and other things. Um, I don't know how much this um, bears out, but there are certain crimes that um, um, that carry mandatory minimums, such as the drug trafficking crimes and um, so forth, that if you were to look around the courtroom at the group of people that are charged with that, um, you would say there's a racial um, disparity between the people sitting in this room charged with this crime and the, the, the part of the population that those races make up. Um, I don't know the answer to all of that. Um, the only thing I can say is that um, being someone who is edu educable, um, being someone who believes in um, making individual determinations about individual people, that I on my own would search my conscience and use uh, that information. And like I referenced, the wave after wave of the incoming tide of other information to inform me and guide me to the extent that I would have the opportunity, um, as Counselor Devaney um, suggested, that I might at some point become a mentor to other justices if I am confirmed and serve, I would seek to um, mentor that as well. 
Um, in terms of answering the question as to um, how and why the disparities increase in the superior court versus the district court, I don't know that. And I don't know that that study had a, or gave an uh, opinion about that as well, other than to say, not to be repetitive, but the, the ground conclusion, no matter what angle it was looked at, what angle it was analyzed, was that there are implicit biases in the sentencing um, and the charging. Yeah, I appreciate your thoughtfulness around that. And, um, you know, as you noted, uh, the study does control for many factors, including severity of the charge, including uh, sentencing around comparable charges. Um, another factor here is that Black and Latino defendants are twice as likely to be indicted in superior court over district court when there's concurrent jurisdiction. Um, and that's from the report. Twice as likely when there's concurrent jurisdiction to be brought to superior court. Um, it's hard to see the explicit bias, but um, clearly it's in the system. And I appreciate you talking about mentoring judges. And I hope that uh, you do pursue this as an area to bring up in the judiciary, uh, because I think it is the preeminent social justice and civil rights issue in the Commonwealth right now. And I think it's important that Massachusetts continue to lead the nation uh, in having a temporary justice system. So I appreciate your comments today. I appreciate your thoughtfulness and congratulations on your nomination. And again, uh, uh, I note the high praise that you've gotten from. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor DiPaolo, I'm going to, I'm assuming you're, you've concluded. Um, so at this point, as the chair, even though someone else is sitting in my seat there, um, I will um, enter into the record as the chair, as is my responsibility and duty, um, the four letters that we've received from attorney uh, Bernie Grossberg, uh, Justice David Lowy, Caroline Hillis, and Maureen Leal. And I will make sure that that is a permanent part of uh, the hearing today, as again, as the chair is my responsibility and my job, not somebody else's. Um, anyway, I am very pleased to have met you and, and discussed uh, this job with you, Attorney Buxton. Um, I have to say, honestly, I was very leery when I saw yet another prosecutor come forward. Um, and you know, you knew that I was. So uh, the the time you've spent with me, my my diligence that I did on this, um, really gave me peace of mind. Um, your support of another um, nominee uh, who you had litigated against means a lot. That you are uh, obviously open minded and can. Uh, understand the law for what it is and not what people want it to be and have gr gross mis uh, interpretations of, of, of things. Um, so I am very pleased uh, to say that I will enter your name into formal nomination next week. And uh, at that note, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.